should be in tomorrow's session, so you will have uh, some variety and some uh, completely different things to think about, namely immunosenescence and what happens to the immune system during aging of humans in this case. So is there any relevance to this? Well, we know uh, that infectious disease is increased in frequency and severity in the elderly, such as some examples, so this is often anecdotal. And um, one of the reasons for this is likely to be, since the immune system exists, we believe, uh, at least nowadays, evolutionarily, that's not so clear, but the adaptive immune system in uh, animals exists to combat infectious disease, and so it's very likely that the reason for increased severity and increased frequency of infectious disease in the elderly is to do with something that uh, involves failing immunity, so to say. If you look at, uh, very difficult to um, find uh, exact cause of death in elderly people, multiple choice question, as we heard before uh, from the speakers, of course, but some uh, now rather old uh, studies, for example, in Japanese women here, yes, age-associated, uh, classical age-associated diseases, cardiovascular cancer and so on, uh, increase, the, the rate of acceleration of these uh, diseases increases with age, uh, but it plateaus or decreases again at around about maximum life uh, expectancy and, or average life expectancy rather in those countries, 85 or so in the case of Japan here. Whereas death uh, that has been uh, at least associated with infectious disease in the records of these patients does not decelerate but continues essentially for ever. So if you survive the uh, classical uh, age associated degenerative diseases, cancer, possibly neurodegeneration as well, you are likely to have a problem with um, a malfunctioning, dysregulated immune system. Uh, this has been designated inflammaging because of the increased level of inflammatory mediators that are commonly found in elderly people and which are believed to have detrimental effects uh, in some disease states at least. And this ill-defined term immunosenescence that probably we should avoid. What do we mean by this inflammation? Yet there are usually increases in levels of factors in the serum, in the locality of the tissues that are thought to have pro-inflammatory effects, but also anti-inflammatory effects in some of the uh, factors that have been measured. But we have this concept of a low level of chronic inflammation uh, in uh, older people. Immunosenescence is a descriptive term in contrast which really has to mean deleterious age-associated changes to immunity, to immune parameters that have been measured mostly in mice and humans, but in other animals uh, so far uh, studied. This appears to be the case as well, both for innate and adaptive immunity, particularly the adaptive arm of immunity, the memory arm of immunity that is responsible for um, more effective uh, um, responses to a re-challenge by the same pathogen that the individual has previously survived and this is a kind of dysregulation in aging that might be better described as immune frailty. What we know about the development of these uh, states is mostly um, coming from uh, mouse models. Um, the immune system is highly dynamic, cells are generated and used up or cycle dynamically very rapidly in most uh, cases uh, through life and they are all requiring um, an, an intact uh, hematopoietic system to constantly generate the, uh, all components of the blood, red and white cells. So the white cells, we know from um, mouse studies with inbred strains that there is a strong genetic component to this aging effect of the output of uh, immune component cells, but there's also an environmental effect. This translates to higher numbers of stem cells, but with a lower activity per cell that is something to do with a decreased DNA repair capacity. And this alters the proportion of um, cells outputted to the periphery. You have a, a skewing of the production over the life of the animal, presumably, as far as we can tell from looking at uh, the human situation, also the case in humans, you have fewer B cells, the ones that make antibody. You have uh, higher levels of myeloid cells. These are usually uh, monocytes, macrophages that engulf pathogens and also present antigens to the adaptive immune system. More of those are uh, coming out. And lower T cell progenitors, the T cells are the helper cells that help uh, a response uh, of other components in the system, 
to produce antibody against mm -hmm. pathogens and, and to kill, for example, virus-infected uh, host tissues. The, there's a double problem with the T cells because the thymus is an organ in which the progenitors coming out of the bone marrow need to be processed, a highly wasteful and energetic, uh, energy consuming, uh, resource consuming process that essentially stops at puberty in most people. There is residual thymic function uh, until perhaps the fifth, sixth, seventh, or even eighth decade of life at a much lower level. Anyway, this is compromised, so a combination of lower. Uh, T cell progenitors and less thymic activity means that the number of new naive T cells exported to the periphery in later life, these are the cells that have not yet seen antigen, mm -hmm. these are the ones that you need if you are confronted with a pathogen that you haven't seen before in your um, developmental period up to puberty. Older people have fewer naive T cells, or the mice have fewer naive T cells and more memory cells as a result of the accumulation of cells that remember pathogens that they've seen before. So there are several levels at which the responses are compromised. Also innate immunity, these are the components of the immune system that do not have this kind of um, specific uh, detailed memory of previously seen pathogens. These are um, to do with macrophage uh, function, reduced expression of receptors that see patterns that are unique to microorganisms <coughs> shared by host tissue. Many things that are changed over aging as summarized in this picture. And we have um, a whole series of functions that are different in younger animals compared to older animals and people. All of which translates into a generally decreased level of activity that is directed towards protection uh, but has the same uh, friendly fire side effects of increased inflammation during uh, that process. We've been interested in looking more at the adaptive side of immunity, the T lymphocytes, the thymus derived lymphocytes. In humans, of course, when you're looking uh, for differences between young and old, it's very difficult to compare the same thing. Somebody who's now 20 versus somebody who's now 80 is likely to have, have a very different state of health throughout life. Genetics could be different, environment certainly was, nutrition probably was, all these things contribute in looking at human studies to making it difficult in cross-sectional studies to compare like with like. One possible approach is to try to do longitudinal <coughs> studies. Obviously, in long-lived species, this is a challenge. One way of doing this is to look at people who are already very old. They are a special population having survived to be old, mm -hmm. so this is a caveat to the studies. But you can see sufficient clinical correlations over a relatively short follow-up, for example, taking the most robust clinical endpoint, namely mortality. If you start with people who are 85 already, you can follow them for two, four, six years. There's enough mortality to be able to make correlations. And we tried to do this together with um, a group in um, Sweden who, had, uh, who were running such longitudinal studies, um, starting to study people when they reached 85. And slowly from this time onwards, some immunological parameters were added to the um, data that they were gathering on these people. And this was the origin of this perhaps rather unfortunate expression, the immune risk profile, the IRP, which consisted of a series of quite simple, uh, in those at that time, uh, the simple um, uh, laboratory values that you could establish using the peripheral blood. Easy to obtain peripheral blood, otherwise difficult to get tissue from humans. And this was a change in the proportion of T cells in the peripheral blood consistent with the accumulation of very late stage differentiated cells of the cytotoxic type, the type that's responsible for um, protecting the individual against a viral infection, for example. But it also included the lower numbers of B cells, the antibody producing cells. And much to our surprise, initially, positivity uh, infection with a very common and apparently um, harmless, except in immunosuppressed people, harmless herpes virus called cytomegalovirus. And in the meantime, quite a lot of interest has uh, arisen concerning the effect of cytomegalovirus infection on healthy people rather than transplant patients or AIDS patients who have a real serious clinical problem with cytomegalovirus. Interestingly, this IRP that predicted two, four, and six year mortality to some extent was nothing to do with having low frequencies of naive T cells or naive CD8 cells that were measured in this case. So these people who already got to be 85 
having fewer or slightly more naive cells didn't make any difference to their survival. Uh, we've seen this in other studies as well. I think that this is to do with the fact that once you survive to be 85, you're probably not getting exposed to all that many new pathogens. You don't need the naive T cells. But if you traveled a lot, you might need them, and then probably things would look different. And another thing to note about the IRP is that even at 85, it was only present in a minority of the people. So 15% or so, this figure has recurred in different studies in different places and in different waves of these studies from the Unchurch. Sweden. So actually this was a very poor correlation with survival. This is here, this is four year survival in these two studies. And in the risk group after four years in this small study, mortality was at this level, not in the risk group it was at, at this level, for example. So we've been trying to generate a more accurately predictive immune risk profile in the meantime, and this is ongoing work. The difference between people who were in or were not in the risk group is uh, shown here from an older study. These white lines here, the white um, bars show the number of, this is the number of, of, blood, of cells in the blood per microliter, so it's absolute numbers rather than frequencies here. Not much in the way of naive cells in either group, as I said before. Clearly it's these black guys that are different, and these are the latest differentiation stage of, of memory cells. We know in the meantime that the majority of these uh, are recognizing different antigens on cytomegalovirus because most of these old people, like 85, 90% of older people, are infected with cytomegalovirus. It's a virus that infects a high fraction of the population and the fraction that is infected increases with age uh, still in most countries. It's a socioeconomic and hygienic kind of, of thing. In the wild, so to say, the uh, feral uh, situation is that everybody is CMV positive. It's almost um, uh, it's a co-evolved, um, uh, usually non-pathogenic um, virus. There are many limitations of the immune risk profile listed here. We need to um, have this confirmed in different uh, places. We are, as I mentioned, looking for a, a more sophisticated analysis that might give a better correlation with survival, give us some clue as to the mechanisms involved. These are only correlations here. We know we, we, we don't know many things about this, especially um, nutrition, psychological stress, inflammatory pathogen environment. We're not taken into account uh, in any of these uh, uh, rather small and not very detailed studies. So, what we've been trying to do is uh, partially. Um, look into other populations to see whether we can reproduce this. That's difficult. There are not many cohorts around where not only are materials available in terms of you know, DNA samples and so on, as well as the clinical data, but to do this we actually need viable cells. So these are cryopreserved peripheral blood cells. So you have to keep them liquid nitrogen for years and years and years. And this is a study from <coughs> Leiden 85 plus study. So people at this time point that actually they were 89 years older at this time. They were um, 85 when the study was started. So we, we have here cells were frozen down where they were kept for seven years. We could thaw them, analyze them at that time. And we already had the follow-up of survivals as shown in these lines. This is again looking at these naive cells, as I said in the Swedish study, having fewer or more naive T cells didn't affect survival. And as you can see here, it's the same case with a seven year follow up here, there is no difference, there is no survival advantage to having more naive cells uh, in this particular population protected, perhaps not um, very much exposed to new pathogens. Uh, here though the effect is seen that we have a, a larger number of memory cells, low or high proportions in this case of memory cells, and having more of these is now better. Uh, this is a highly um, statistically significant difference in the survival, people who have more of these memory cells are surviving for a longer period of time. We interpret this to mean that these memory cells, many or most of which are specific for cytomegalovirus, are exerting their beneficial effect on survival via a more uh, uh, appropriate, let's say, control mm -hmm. of this persistent beta herpes virus. Reading out, of course, from 89 years is a very selective population already, but we believe, and there are some, some evidence for this, that this particular virus is also uh, having negative consequences in earlier life, much before 
18, 19 years of age, we have tried to do some functional studies that I won't go into in detail now to see not only what is the number of cells in these individuals that might correlate with uh, good or bad, better or worse survival, but what they're doing. And we can find some functional um, uh, phenotypes which are informative for um, this question. And we can see that the functionality of these T cells, what we're looking at is consistent with their having an antiviral effect that is still only a correlation, but which is getting us closer to the mechanisms uh, that might be responsible for what we're measuring in the peripheral blood of the phenotype. We're also looking at antibodies against cytomegalovirus. These are younger and older individuals here, quite large numbers. Each one of these is, a, uh, is an individual person. And as you can see in human studies, you always have this huge variation, clearly. But there is, if you look at, on average, <coughs> sorry, if you look on average, there is a significant uh, higher amount of a particular form of antibody here, specific for this virus, in older people. And this illustrates, I think, a compensatory mechanism which we're also seeing at the cellular immune level because it's so important for the individual to keep this virus under control. You need to invest more and more resources in doing that over time. And without going into this rather complicated slide here, we had imagined that antibodies against this virus might be less effective in the elderly immunosenescence, things not working so well. But actually, what we found in this um, study of the ability of antibodies in the serum of older people to prevent viral infection in vitro, they, these surviving people of, this is a Belgian study now, of people over 80, uh, from uh, one of the speakers tomorrow, Cathy, Cathy Matai, is running this Belfrail study that she might say something about tomorrow. <coughs> the um, elderly survivors uh, in this group have antibodies that are much more potent at neutralizing cytomegalovirus than even younger women. So for the survival of the species, it's essential that child-bearing uh, or women of uh, child-bearing age protect their baby against infection with cytomegalovirus. So the main clinical um, indication, apart from transplantation and so on, uh, iatrogenic or, or pathogenic suppression is when a baby is born, it's like with HIV, a CMV positive mother, which would be the case in the wild, gives birth normally to a CMV negative baby. The baby's not infected. If the baby gets infected immediately, its immune defenses cannot handle uh, this uh, infection and that host is not going to reproduce. So it's in, in the interest of the virus, that doesn't happen. So what normally happens is that the mother who is CMV positive protects the child by providing antibody against CMV in the milk. And after a couple of months, the CMV, anti, anti, uh, uh, CMV uh, virus reactivates in the mother and then infects the baby. So the uh, capacity of the antibodies in young women to neutralize the virus for the survival of the species has to be very strong. Nonetheless, in the older survivors, the capacity of their antibody to neutralize this virus is even stronger. So this, I think, is a compensatory mechanism. You have lots of cells, you have lots of antibody, you have lots of cells producing the antibody, and your whole immune system is obsessed with controlling this particular virus. So there is very little capacity left. And the side effects of doing that are probably also negative, including higher levels of inflammatory mediators that are coming from these um, virus-specific cells. So there's a very large commitment of um, immunological resources uh, contributing to um, uh, many um, negative um, effects in the older people, I think. We have looked at the relevance of uh, CMV and the necessary uh, immune responses against CMV, negative consequences of this on responses to other viruses, for example. And here in the elderly, of course, influenza uh, is um, a major public health problem. Uh, and uh, many studies, uh, including some, a couple of reviews here, show that even younger people who are infected with CMV, <coughs> their immune responses against other things, including influenza uh, seasonal vaccines, are different, are generally reduced in the ability of the vaccine to generate protective um, antibodies and cells against the virus. Um, I think that I will skip some of these data slides to 
has come here to um, a summary of what we think the impact of CMV is. It's part of the immune risk profile, but of course it's not the explanation. People who are CMV positive are not guaranteed to do worse than people who are CMV negative. And at very old age, there are very few CMV negative people around. So these studies are quite difficult to do, but when you gather together, recruit sufficient older people who are nonetheless CMV negative, one sees that many of the age-associated parameters that have been published as being due to a change with age are actually dependent upon whether that person is infected with CMV. And if you find a group of older people who are not infected with CMV, then they do not show that previously assumed age-associated change, such as this accumulation of a very large number of these late differentiated CD8 cells. That's driven predominantly, not entirely, but predominantly by cytomegalovirus. Whereas we know that the decrease uh, in the number of naive cells, that doesn't have anything to do with CMV. That's happening anyway. But this big accumulation of cells that you have to have, a compensatory mechanism to keep cytomegalovirus under control. So there is a fraction that remains CMV negative. And why that is, is something we've been interested in. Is that genetic component? Do these people not get infected because for some reason they have innate defenses against the virus or there's some other reason they don't have the receptor that, like with HIV that CMV can use to get into the cells. We think, yes, looking at, uh, for example, the Leiden longevity families where uh, the F2 generation has a 30% reduced standardized mortality rate compared to the general population coming from families where their, one of their parents had a sibling, or at least one sibling, who uh, got to be 90 years old, and where that parent also got to be 90 years old. So an enrichment of um, presumably still to be identified uh, genetic polymorphisms responsible for imbuing the F2 generation with a 30% reduced standardized mortality rate between the age of 40 and 80. Their immune system, when they become infected with CMV, does not show the same effects as the 99.5% 90, 90, of the rest of the population. This is half a percent of the population as in the long-lived family group. So there are genetic components in there. We're also looking at twins, Danish twins in this case, to see uh, what that might be as well. So this might confer to these long-lived people an immunological advantage. This is the live longevity study that I will just have to go through faster here. So to, 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 to finalize this, Cytomegalovirus, that has nothing to do with aging, of course. But since there is an increase in the proportion of individuals who are infected with this virus in the US, in uh, European populations, since we're not all CMV positive at the beginning, for example, in a population that we studied in Pakistan, uh, not in the lowest socioeconomic class, these were young male medical students, all of them CMV positive. So being seen to be negative is kind of an artifact of civilization, of hygiene and so on. This is a study from uh, the big um, um, uh, nutritional healthy aging study in the US, the Haynes 3 study. And these survival lines of middle-aged people, most of them were much older than 25, so mostly middle-aged people for 10 years here, looking at whether or not they're infected with um, cytomegalovirus and whether or not they have a higher level of um, an inflammatory marker, C-reactive protein, just to so that say that people are not CMV positive and have a low inflammatory mediator level, as, it, as reflected by CRP levels, show this survival line, all cause mortality, but predominantly cardiovascular here. Whereas if you are CMV positive and show this a higher level of, of, of basal inflammation, then survival is significantly worse. So perhaps uh, even in younger individuals, not extreme age only, CMV is not really as harmless as one had um, assumed. Of course, we still can't say that CMV causes these changes because you can't go around infecting people who are CMV negative with CMV. That is done sometimes when a CMV positive kidney transplant, for example, is put into a CMV negative donor and then you get a primary infection, but that is in the face of immunosuppressive drugs and antiviral agents, as is done nowadays. So, you can see things like that, but 
we would say yes, probably CMV is causing these deleterious changes. They're, they're changes to immunity. They are dynamic, it's not cross-sectional. It's a change caused by CMV, and we believe we have enough data to say that these are mostly or entirely deleterious changes that are going on here that look as if they're age-associated because of the increasing fraction of individuals who are infected with CMV uh, with age. So what can you do? Well, there are antivirals, there are antibodies, pharmaceuticals, antisense. You can vaccinate. People who are CMV positive can still be boosted by vaccines. There are a couple of vaccine candidates about that were developed in order to protect um, young women who were CMV negative of childbearing age. That was the reason that um, Sanofi, for example, developed an anti-CMV vaccine to treat with anti-inflammatories. Immune modulators very much um, uh, in use now to modulate responses against cancer antigens in cancer patients, showing some remarkable successes in treating patients with otherwise previously really um, untreatable cancers like pancreas and lung cancers. But not everyone is CMV positive and in modern life, in Western countries at least, the fraction of people who are CMV negative at any age is increasing, so there's less and less CMV around. So there may be more and more disease around because CMV isn't there in early life doing something beneficial perhaps. But in general, we would think that it's probably a good thing to get rid of CMV. It's likely that it's not really going to be um, very helpful in Western society. It's likely to have uh, only the negative effects that can be ascribed to it, as some of which I've shown you. And uh, if you have other sources of this kind of chronic antigenic stress, the immune system is constantly being stimulated by the persistent presence of, this foreign, of these foreign antigens, there are other things doing that as well. Are they going to be additive together with CMV? But that would be even longer and a much different story. Uh, we are indebted and dependent on a very large number of collaborations because, as you might imagine, recruiting, characterizing, uh, maintaining these human cohorts is incredibly uh, labor intensive, incredibly expensive, and one has to try to access uh, many um, different studies in order to do that. And I would like to say thank you very much for your, uh, your the surprise you had, not hearing more about glycation, but already getting a taste of the esoteric world of human immunology. Thank you.